so in this gospel today, we hear these words. He is not a God of the dead, but of the living. For to him all are alive. These are hopeful words for us during this month of November, this month that we remember the dead. We pray for the souls of the faithful departed, for our loved ones who have gone on to eternal life. God is a God of the living, not a God of the dead. In the first reading, we have these accounts from Maccabees, second Maccabees. And we have one of the sons, the seven sons, that were martyred saying the following words, the king of the world will raise us up to live again forever. It is for his laws that we are dying. You see, at this time, these young men were given a choice to either do what the king asked them to do, to eat this pork that was forbidden by the law of God or to die. And all seven of these men chose to die rather than to violate God's law, God's commandment, God's plan for them as his chosen people. And it was pretty heroic the way in which they went out. If we continue on a few verses on, it says, it was from heaven that I received these tongue and hands for the sake of his laws I disdain them for him I hope to receive them again so this is again a very clear message that no matter what is done to our body here on earth in this case martyrdom of these men our bodies are once again going to be raised up by God from the dead and we're going to receive a glorified body. If we lose our hands, if we lose our tongue, if we lose our head, if we lose any member of our body here on earth, when we raise up from the dead, we're going to have a glorified body. We're going to be with Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit in heaven for all of eternity, worshiping him, glorifying him, experiencing the blessings of God. And then he continues, one of the other sons says, it is my choice to die at the hands of men with the hope God gives of being raised up by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. He's speaking of the king because the king doesn't believe in God. The king doesn't believe that there's a resurrection. The king doesn't have this faith in a God who is merciful, a God who forgives, a God who raises up from the dead. Another passage from Maccabees is uh, when there was a battle, uh, the Israelite army, the Maccabees army, was very badly defeated. And as some of them were going back and bringing the bodies of the dead to be buried, they discovered that there was an amulet on each and every one of the dead that was a pagan god. It was a false god. It was a god other than their god, the god of Israel. And one of the things that they did is they said, let's take up a collection and let's offer prayers for these fallen men. Let's pray for mercy. Let's pray that God will be merciful on their souls. So already before Jesus came, there was already hope, hope of the resurrection, hope that God would be merciful on those who even, in this case, turned away from him and offered false offerings to a false god. And then finally in St. Paul, we hear St. Paul saying, pray for us that we may be delivered from perverse and wicked people. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. See, these are powerful words. So we, of course, are all still alive. 
We want to be strengthened by God. We want to be given the graces and blessings and the gifts of God. We want to be able to live a life that's following the commands of God as these seven sons did in this first reading. And we need help. We need grace. We need the Word of God. We need one another. We need community. We need the sacraments. We need sanctifying grace. But we also need prayers, as St. Paul asked for in the second reading. We need to pray for one another. We lift each other up in prayer each and every time we come to the Mass, but also in our daily prayers, we pray for one another. This is the mystical body of Christ. This is what we do for each other, to strengthen each other here on earth. But finally, and the reason for this Mass and the reason for this month of November, this month where we remember the souls of the faithful departed and pray for them, is we believe as Catholic Christians, based on this account from Maccabees and other New Testament accounts, that at times when people die, they've already chosen to go and follow God. They've already chosen heaven. They've chosen mercy. They've chosen Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They've chosen to humbly say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, and to be forgiven of those sins. But sometimes there's attachments to patterns of behavior in our lives. There's attachments to sins in our lives. There might even be attachments to people. Maybe some of our loved ones that are still here on earth, we can't quite let let go of yet we're not quite ready to go into the fullness of God's glory and so what we believe is that at the moment of death if somebody is in the state of grace they already are in heaven are going they're on their way to heaven but before they can be in the fullness of God's glory and before they can experience fully this gift of being in heaven and gazing upon his face and having nothing other than love for God and love for neighbor, they have to be purified of anything that falls short of that unconditional love for God and unconditional love for neighbor. And this is what we call purgatory. We call the purifying fires of purgatory. And that's why we pray for the souls of our loved ones who have died. God, have mercy upon their souls. Burn off these impurities. Give them the grace to let go of whatever it might be. It could be anger. It could be resentment. It could be unforgiveness. It could be judgmental and critical ways of thinking. We don't know what is on a person's mind or heart at the moment that they die and what they're not quite yet ready to let go of. So today we come to Jesus. We have these candles here that represent 30 plus of our loved ones that we've entrusted to the Lord's mercy in this Mass today. And we have this book of remembrance that's up on the table, which will be out this whole entire month, as I mentioned in the introduction. And we have the names of the faithful departed written in there. And this book will be out with a pen where you can even write the names of others who are not mentioned today in this book. So, I just encourage you to continue to pray for the souls of the faithful departed. Continue to pray for the souls in purgatory. And don't lose hope that they're already in heaven with God, on their way to heaven with God, and just need a little bit of extra help, a little bit of extra grace, a little bit of extra mercy. And this brings me to the sort of second part of my homily today where I'm going to transition into the seventh homily in this series of homilies we've been given, this retreat we've been giving. There are a lot of reasons why we aren't ready yet to go to the fullness of God's glory in heaven. And one of the biggest ones is sin and the consequences of sin. And so for us, we have to recognize we're in a battle there are powers and principalities and forces, not human forces, but spiritual forces that want to steal our souls and bring them to hell. Satan does not want us to be in heaven. And there are things going on in the world around us that are just confusing us and causing all kinds of 
division and anger and hatred and there's all kinds of lies and deceptions of the enemy that are being put out there that are just causing all kinds of troubles and all kinds of problems for us. We need to be aware of these powers. We need to be aware of these principalities and these forces. And we need to ask God to help us to fight against them. The people are just like you and me. We're people who allow temptation, allow sin, allow evil to come into our lives. And sometimes we do things and say things and support things that are sinful and evil. But the real enemy is the devil, the forces behind these things, the forces that's causing these things to happen. So if you want to look at it from a historical perspective, it's always been this way since the beginning of human history. In the beginning, we had Adam and Eve, and it was perfect. They were in paradise. They were already in a living heaven here on earth. But sin entered in, and from that point on, there's been problems through generations and generations and generations. So, going back to Maccabees, we had this king who wanted to kill anyone who refused to eat pork and to make this unnecessary sacrifice. And these men stood up and even died a death of martyrdom because of their faith. It wasn't that king it was the enemy. It was the devil. It was evil working through that king that brought these innocent men and many others to death. Again, bringing us to the gospel, Saint, or the second reading, St. Paul talks about it. At the time Paul was walking the earth, there were tremendous persecutions against Christians. Christians were put up as, if you've ever heard of it, Roman candles. They were burned alive to light up the city at night. This was a reality that Christians faced. But who was behind that? The devil, the powers, the principalities, the forces of evil. You move forward to uh, this time uh, within which we're living today. We have forces of evil at work. We have things going on that we can't accept. We have people dying. We have innocent lives being taken. We have all kinds of people who are not being treated with respect and dignity as beloved sons and daughters of God the Father. There's another story in the scriptures that many of you might be familiar with. Queen Esther. Queen Esther. She was heroic. She actually was a Jewish woman who ended up becoming part of she ended up becoming the queen of a non-Jewish king. And he didn't know that she was Jewish. And there was a point when, because of a wicked servant in the king's court, they were going to put to death all of the Jewish people in the entire kingdom just because they're Jewish. They were just going to kill them all. And it was about to happen. And she discovered this, Queen Esther. And she took a risk. She went to the king without being invited. And at this time, if you went to the king without being invited and he didn't extend his scepter out to you, you'd be killed immediately. So she went and she stood and she waited and he extended the scepter and she went up and told him, you can't do this. These are my people. They're being wrongfully persecuted, and if we exterminate this whole race, it's going to be wrong. And the king changed, and he actually didn't exterminate the Jews, and he actually exterminated the, the wicked servant that was trying to get him to exterminate all the Jews. God's justice came through the heroic action of a queen, Queen Esther. God's justice came through the seven sons who witnessed to God's love and mercy. God's justice came through St. Paul who went around and brought this message of life, this message of hope, this message of the gospel, no matter what. Stoning, imprisonment, everything that happened to him, he didn't let it stop him from bringing the message out. Today, we're living in a time within which we have to proclaim the message of life, the gospel of life, 
And this is a time like no other time. The time is now to be prophetic. So with this Proposition 3, this Proposal 3, we're called as Catholic Christians to go out and tell people what it is and how harmful it is and why we need to oppose it. So I'm going to finish my homily today with not my words, but the words of our Archbishop, Archbishop Vigneron. I think he can speak much more eloquently than I about this proposal and about why we need to be like Queen Esther and to be prophetic in this time with it which we're living and to go out and to not only vote against it, but to let others know that they need to vote against it and to be a prophetic witness in this culture so much in need of the truth that comes from the gospel of life. So let's just take a moment and we'll finish by listening to the words of Archbishop Vigneron. In chapter 4 of the book of Esther, we read a passage that speaks to our current situation in the state of Michigan. Mordecai, Esther's adoptive father, poses this question. Who knows? Perhaps it was for a time like this that you became queen. Just as God created Esther for that moment in history, God created us for this specific time and place. It's not by chance that you and I are here, days before we and all citizens in Michigan are being asked to decide on an issue of paramount importance to protecting the inherent God-given dignity of all people. On November 8, voters in Michigan will decide on Proposal 3, an amendment to the state constitution that would allow unregulated abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy. It is the most extreme proposal concerning abortion in any state or country. Due to its broad and vague language, Proposal 3 would invalidate dozens of existing laws relating to abortion, resulting in legalized partial birth abortion, unregulated and unsafe abortion clinics, abortions performed by unqualified individuals, no parental consent or informed consent, taxpayer-funded abortion, and more. If passed, this change to our state constitution would make Michigan a place where abortions are performed anywhere, at any time, by any person, for any reason. It pushes the boundaries of all people of goodwill, not just those who are pro-life. And most importantly, it would have lasting consequences for generations to come. I urge you to vote no on Proposal 3. Help build a culture in which every human life is valued and women and families readily receive the support they need to thrive. Just as Queen Esther had a role to play, we were created for a time like this. It's time for us to do our part. Let us pray for a conversion of hearts, help others to understand the dangers of this proposal, and vote no on Proposal 3, rejecting its destructive approach to human life. Our Lady of Guadalupe, patroness of the unborn, Pray for us.